Hey, this is Misery Loves Company, a weekly social reading series hosted by MiseryTourism.com. Every Friday, we welcome outsider and transgressive writers to come and share their work with us. And it's Friday again. And in fact, this is the last Misery Loves Company of 2023. And it's also the, the last Misery Loves Company before Christmas. So if anyone has any holiday theme shit to read, uh, do it. I. Should I should I put on the Santa hat or not put on the Santa hat? I've got the hat. Santa hat. Hold on. There, there have been. Hat. I thought it was maybe a little too early before Christmas to put it on. Okay, all right. Put it on. It's so, the last time we'll see each other. Oh, this looks ever. awful. It's I'm all forehead now. How do I? Fucking... <laughs> Just oh, like pull some idiot. strands this of your hair idiot. down and oh, okay. have hang all over right. your we eyes. Got it. We got it. We got it. We're doing this. <laughs> We're doing this until my forehead gets so sweaty that I have to take it off. Anyway, um. Just like. Get it? Like what I'm doing horribly right now. Get some strands down. Okay. I Okay. All right. James, good thing you're yeah. unmuted because you were reading first tonight. All right. Is that the official starting gun? That is the starting gun. The floor is yours. Right. I wasn't sure if I was going to do this, but I have a few short pieces and I'm doing something right now. And if it goes down in flames, it goes down in flames. It's a song. There's no real preamble. Originally, this was like, I thought, I'll write a song about this place. And then I thought that's too cheesy and cutesy. So this will not take up too much of your time. And then I have a few short pieces. No like Rudy marathons, no like excerpts from Cat's novels. So hopefully I don't burn through too much time. It, it won't take that much time if you count it all up. I tried to be a poet, man. My right hand is called Sabotage. He's dying out there. Someone please collect your man. I can't believe I'm already washed. I started going to those meetings. You know, those meetings for people with real problems. Hung with all the exhaust pipe cases, just short as of lost as you can be. Somebody read to me, somebody feed me, I'm bloated with sickness and love. I'm on an airplane, somebody scare me, have the heart to give me a shove unless you're out of love. I know it's out of love. Now I've got a gun, don't worry, not for you. Why you think I've got so many pairs of shoes? You know I never pay retail for anyone. I'll trade you my human suit, this battery and fuse. Everything I think, everything I sing, I get it all battered and used. I do this to myself and for myself, and that's a blessing twice removed. I capitulated to too many guitars that said my name. I want each of them numbered and strung up and hung on memory lane. Oh, somebody read to me. Somebody feed me, I'm bloated with sickness and love. I'm on an airplane, somebody scare me, have the heart to give me a shove. Hurry up, hurry up, I know it's out of love, and I wouldn't be insecure if I was already here. My flashpoints of vanity I've been unwittingly practicing. My mind insists on something divine. Like, yeah, that's why I never unwind. All the hell I sell you is to bit penny dreadful crime. That's how I get you nickel and dime. Somebody read to me, somebody feed me, I'm bloated with sickness and love, and I'm on an airplane, somebody scare me, hurry the fuck up, hurry up, unless you're out of love. 
I know it's out of love. I played that like once before, so um, okay. Uh, okay, I'm kind of sweaty now. Um, thank you, everybody. Oh yeah, I love Matthew Good. Honestly, um, Matthew Good band, Matthew Good solo. I I can kind of see that. Um, thank you so much. Okay, I better hurry up here. Uh, I'm going to read the newest thing that I wrote. I kind of finished it today. This is uh, called Invincible. And it's a dead short story that I turned into a very short story. Okay. Fucking pick out of the way. She gave it to me bare knuckle. You've been slipping. What about having each other's backs? You've been gone a long time. I stepped out into the warm rain, lit a rainy cigarette, just about smokable. When you punch someone, punch through them. Aim at the wall behind the guy you want to hit. She didn't need a wind-up. I'd provided her that. I sat against the gate outside the house for a longer moment than I'd intended. The sig had gone, the sig had gone from limp dick to messy particle garbage, some of it on my shirt, some of the sawdust dirt rubbed into my fingers, some floating already in the water flow under the drain. Petrichor rose in its attempt to get under my nose, summoned memories of summer's past, playing around on pavements damp with drizzle, but nothing was conjured and no pain earned. Everything was too much and so it was nothing. I made my soppy way to Jackie's old friend, buzzing his door well past midnight and there he was. She got rid of you? Said I was slipping. Not something I'm not aware of. Look at the pictures, she looks the same. Every year I'm a little bit bigger, hair a little thinner, a less convincing look on my face, lines that used to be from laughter. Everybody ages, said Jackie in a helpful voice. Sometimes what time does, what you do to time, sorry if I'm fuzzy here, sometimes the years on your face, that visible living, don't come from what you do but what you don't, and I've done a lot of that. Well, there's the couch, as you know, anything from the fridge. There's a fan by the couch. Pretty sure it has a heat switch, too. I didn't want to thank Jackie. There was, though, a version of me out there somewhere who remembered Jackie, all that dirt we kicked up, remembered his couch with an always-on vacancy sign for friends like me and the millions of times I'd slept on it, and that person would have been very grateful. Where the fuck else would I even go? Thanks, Jack. Yeah, man. I'll be at Aikido this morning, but hit me up when I'm back if you want to. Good night. Good night. The wrinkled leather of the sofa meant or felt like something, but I didn't know what. Not yet. I don't know what. I'm eyeballing the ceiling and rolling over, and maybe I will hit him up tomorrow, and... I woke up on the soft but strangely loud crunch of slept on leather. It sounded loud to me, anyway. This is how it feels to be invincible. Let me finish. I'll hang up first. Few years gone by, bridges alight under my feet, a limp dick cigarette in my teeth, Friends are strangers, and perfect strangers are perfect strangers. Love's a long-solved old mystery. Job's done and ditched. Rent is in on a new place, shitty on the outside. The photos I got of the interior were blurry. I walked to the doorway, and the picture's still smudging the room, biting the walls and getting through to the outside. I walked to the doorway. I walked through the doorway and say, Honey, I... That's it for that one. got i think two more i th i think um let's see poems yeah that's probably it poem it's called poem okay those stars didn't plan on burning out it was hanging out with you and you gave them posthumous shards of time warp trauma and now you see them rocking their scars burying their asses those retrograde stab wounds doing all the work for you earthbound lovers in the dirt. To plagiarize a phrase, what they think is not work is work. The insiders know, and I miss you.
And when you prism your blood cut bullets, the ricochet leaves me powder burned, a vernacular hard on pushing out my mouth. And those shell case stars rattle down all over me and I get ready for work. If you're going to fall, make like a stunt man, blink twice for stab the pedal, roll the V8 and go down harder than the cracked pill, none bitterer that got you here. And screaming, Jay Hawkins was born screaming, the spellbind of childbirth, that must have been it. And when I flame out, fade away, or you take the chainsaw to my umbilical claws, I'll still be that scratching sound behind the mirrors. They line your hallway and tune your steps off the key of anything. Those noises and bumps and red spots you wake up with come from somewhere, and they are not rats, not this time. That was a poem. Um, this is supposed to be read in September, but forget I say that. And this was sort of like a Halloween poem. Somebody told me to write one, so. This is going to go against what I heard William say about dream sequences and how they should actually make sense when you write them. Um, okay. They called him mild mannered, not knowing of the gun in his desk. They called him friendly, knowing perfectly well the scarecrow kept in his yard was his only friend. They called his face mother. They called his jack-o'-lanterns lifelike. They called him so much. He put on, he put a tux on his scarecrow and went to a wedding. The kids in the neighborhood scared him and he scared the grown-ups. His son Dax wants to be an, ask, an actor. His first wife wants to leave Tuscaloosa for good this time. His bottle wishes he wouldn't use so much tongue. The power poles really look up to this guy. Uh. One of these days, he's going to put one of those pumpkins on his head and see if anybody notices. He hangs around the senior center wearing a pumpkin carved with a shit-eating grin and drinks coffee, and the coffee puts the fire out. The people there are too old and congested to smell the smoke. Crows start landing on his rotting orange head, and he sees less and less of his best friend. The librarians stalk the horror section well. Novels of rat flesh, whose hauntings shed off in the spring and come back to play when the feeling takes. He keeps the light on. He drops acid. The cops call him to ask if he's all right. They saw somebody downtown smoking a candle. Eventually, inertia turns itself out, and Dax the Scarecrow gets a, his big break in Hollywood playing a good old Tuscaloosa woman who just can't get a break. Thursday, the 31st, a tuxedo shows up in his mailbox, and his phone rings for the first time in a long time. It's only September, but if we film it right, we make them think it's Halloween. James, you fucking killed it, man. That was phenomenal. I, so I get, I dig, I don't know if you want me to like, sorry, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. What were you going to say? I, I guess I have one more thing. If I can find it. Oh, you did? I'm uh, sorry. I thought, yeah, I, no. I thought, uh, you, what is that noise? The trolls are, the trolls are out in force tonight and they are, <laughs> they are, um, they're rowdy. <laughs> <laughs> all right james sorry i mean if i can even cat do you know where ghosts is <laughs> i don't sorry okay i think next one it'll take like one second i think it's on google docs Do the trolls have a, a soundboard with, with moaning on it, I guess? Tonight they do. <laughs> um, let's see here. So this is actually the earliest one you're going to get. This is probably 2017 or 2018. Um, so this is pretty old. I've read it before in a couple different places. Um, Cat's uh, sadly defunct publishing printing press uh actually published it for the first time and the last time and i'll forever be grateful for that and this is called ghosts there are ghosts in here look but not too quickly now move your head slowly keep your pupils right there in the middle like you're trying to glimpse a floater as it floats past but don't go after them do not give chase 
they are remembering you and what it means to be you just as slowly, and it is a subtle, fragile process. It is a hard and a sour thing after being so long without it to look directly at life and for you to see in final fulfillment all your dreams and predictions of death. They will flit the edges and concentrate acutely on mundane things, penetrate the folds of your leather coat to hear it creak and to remember its soft warmth. This is as much humanity as they can stand yet. Soon they may breathe on the back of your neck as you stand on a cold pavement waiting for the subway, giving back a gift, a taste of what you will soon know intimately. In this way you will bond, meet in the middle, two stages of the same thing that will one day overlap in a Venn diagram. You will prepare each other for what is to come and what has come. Right now you are looking in your cupboard for something to eat. It has been a hard day. The people at your work say you look tired. You are, have been. You take a can of tuna and think about calling into work to say you're not going. If you don't go, nobody will come in your place. You wish you had a ghost that could go for you, or a robot to present the basic facts of you and do the work that needs to be done. It wouldn't be cheating if it was just like you or had some part of you in it. You make a tuna fish sandwich with lettuce and mayonnaise and realize too late that you are not hungry. Something has spoiled your appetite, gotten between your body with its needs and your mind with its wants and severed the cable. You do not eat but smoke and drink coffee, separating the hunger even further. Perhaps it is your boyfriend who is a poet. He has been telling you things that are not true. He has been saying that you are not real. He says that living with you is like living with a ghost. Or maybe he is the ghost. He doesn't know. He is a poet. True, there is lost time. Time that is marked by progress reports on the internet, but that didn't happen and won't come back. Sitting alone and waiting for nothing and thinking about things you've already thought about. You won't remember it until you do it again, impersonating yourself. Echoes, reruns, lost time. The ghosts are bad tonight. Their voices still sound like shattered glass in your ears. You check to see if you are bleeding. They are, but you are not. Someday you will adapt to their lingua franca and there will be no language barrier. Your boyfriend comes in and he is invisible because he isn't doing anything new. He sits down at the piano and plays the notes he played last night and no new ones. The symphony of unplayed notes is deafening. You go into work. The people say you look tired. You wonder for a second if you sent your ghost or double and you are still back there listening to the old notes on the piano. Your boss walks up and it smells like he hasn't showered. There is a crisis and there will be layoffs. He is telling you politely that you may be one of them but not to lose hope. There is no hope to lose. You don't care and the robot smiles. You go home from work and eat your old tuna fish sandwich. It tastes even better this way because you are ravenous. The ghosts are ashamed because they don't share your hunger. They blush and turn invisible. You are standing at the subway and there is no breath on your back. You know their tricks and they no longer scare you. You no longer scare them, so they go looking for someone else to understand. One of you gets on the subway and one of you goes back home and writes about ghosts. It starts like this. There are ghosts in here. Look but not too quickly now. So, as, as I started to say before, you fucking killed it, man. I, for, for, and Rudy can back this up, for the longest time, I've been saying we need to get people to actually play music at Misery Loves Company. We've had people come and do, people, some people have done stand-up, they've done all kinds of different, like performance art adjacent shit, but I think you're only like the second or third person to to actually come and provide live music, which I think is just like the perfect opener for any event. And that song was fucking awesome, man. Your oh, really? was Thank you so beautiful. Much. Was honestly fucking beautiful. But what I really want to talk about though is the first piece that you read because I really love the way that piece is written i love the way that it had like almost a noir kind of approach right like it had oh, that the kind shape. of short story ish well i mean post. like uh, like film noir like you know right. like a, yeah you know, oh the short story ish piece yeah i it had a real like film noir feeling to it but without like the like excesses of noir it felt like a real 
it's like applying that noir lens to like mundane reality. I the opening line in that piece, the um, which I wrote down here so that I wouldn't forget, is that she gave it to me bare knuckle. That is such a great no. That is such a great concise evocative opening line. You know exactly like you get the tone of that piece from that opening line. Boom, immediately you know what you're in for. And everything else just unfurled from there. And it all had that kind of very con concise, sort of hard-bitten, bleak approach to it. It's just, it's a beautifully written piece. Oh, and so uh, I don't want to go, I'm not going to go on forever, but I did also want to point out in that, in the first poem that you read, the the screaming Jay Hawkins was barring screaming line is so fucking good. <laughs> it's, it's such a good line because... It, it it takes something that's particular to him, right? It it right. and makes it universal to the human experience. We were all fucking born screaming, <laughs> and so like whatever, like you know, what's pathetic is that that didn't cross my mind. Really, at all, not even a little bit. I just wrote "Screaming Jay Hawkins was born screaming." That I man, it's it's great though because I didn't I, even think about babies. I wasn't even. I was thinking about him grown up, probably. Oh, so, wow, that's go, fascinating. Go on, it's, it, but it's so perfect, right? Because it takes what we think of him as a musician, right? Like the agony of the... I put a spell on you and how... It, so visceral. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. And I then just, it I takes like that and it applies it backwards to the, the human experience. So that like agony that he's expressing in his music, that like, as you said, that like visceral <laughs> screeching kind of approach is like universal, like becomes this kind of universal expression of human angst and suffering. So it's awesome, man. It is, it is good, good stuff. And I'm glad yeah. you read and performed tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. That song, uh, that fucking rock, man, the, uh, it reminds me actually not, I mean, Matthew Good is kind of my go-to because I listen to him a lot. But uh, it reminds oh, yeah. me actually of like Edwin. There's a Canadian guy named Edwin uh, Trippin. I'm not, I'm not familiar. Are single. you only going to compare him to other Canadian musicians? I know, it's so <laughs> racist, right? But, he, but no, it's got that like kind of like gravelly, like kind of like almost like Tom Waits, but like not that like more, I guess like pop, not pop exactly isn't the right word but like there's a song like it has like william mentioned noir and that first piece especially with the way your voice was in the beginning of it uh definitely reminds me of that like definitely like a real noiry like dark kind of broody type of shit and i love that kind of stuff that's my thing okay thank you so much and yeah i, I love matthew good maybe we can talk about that later yeah Sounds no he's like awesome <laughs> When when you heard, read that piece, oh sorry, oh is that, well when you read that piece, uh, Invincible, <laughs> I thought, oh no, it's just I'm glad I had said that I had already mentioned about Matthew Good, you know, but no, I, I love have Matthew Indestructible. Good. There was a... oh, it was Indestructible. Indestructible. That's what was. How? Oh man, have fuck my yeah, stereo. Dude. Sorry, <laughs> we're gonna get we're gonna get a copyright takedown now. <laughs> No. All right. Thanks so much, James. That was awesome. And Kat is up next. I'm like, I'd, uh, I'd blush if I could. Thank you so much. And go, Kat. All right. I'm going to mute myself. Well, fuck you for making me follow that. Um, I'm going to read two things that are old. There was this like project I was doing like 2017, 2018, where I was getting tweets from Jaden Smith and I was using them as titles for poems. And I would write these like prose poems. And I, I kind of was going to put them in like a chapbook or something. And then I decided not to, like, I think somebody convinced me it was a stupid idea, which it absolutely wasn't. Um, but then they just kind of got cannibalized by my books that have come out since then. But I'm going to read two of them. One's really depressing. And then one is like my favorite one. So I read the depressing one first so that you can enjoy the funny one. Um, so the tweet and the title is once you go in, you always come out alive. The piano falls on your head and you become some crinkled accordion, swaying for a few seconds but always popping back into shape. Laugh track, credits, the black that comes after, that's the part that gets me. You watch the show but don't stay long enough to see the silence wash jaggedly over the room like a memory of a memory. But I listen, maybe too much. I follow your instructions. Close eyes, picture beach, smell ocean. I'm supposed to be okay then, staring out. But isn't it all just something we do while we're waiting? 
Isn't it all just an hourglass basin trickling down? I'm sitting in a room that you tell me we've been sitting in together, but I'm the only one who smells it burning. I, a piece of kindling cut from some other piece of kindling. I, some willless domino and a string of willless dominoes. I, a freak accident of purposeless cells trying to become more than themselves. We can drink and fuck all we want, but we're only ever filling holes. You hold me and I don't know how to tell you we aren't really holding each other. Do you think we'll wake up after all of this is over? Will it even be worth it to come back? So that's the one. And the other one, which is my favorite one, and I think this is like one of my favorite poems ever for some reason. Um, the tweet and the title is, I saw Owen Wilson one time from a distance and we just stared at each other, then his car drove off. In the story I tell myself, things are different. He pulls a rather dangerous Yui at the next intersection and parallel parks on the other side of the street. I cross over like my legs are being controlled by someone else and I almost get hit by a car before I make it to the other curb, but I do make it there. And just as he's getting out of his Porsche, he smiles. I don't say my first thought, which is that someone with a Porsche shouldn't drive like an asshole. You think a man who starred in not one, not two, but three animated movies about sentient automobiles would know that. Anyway, he's there and I'm there and we give each other this look. Hey you, he says. Hey Lightning McQueen, I say. The resulting shoulder punch sends thousands of volts through both of our bodies. He asks if I want to get out of here, and I say yes, even though I was actually on my way to meet you. Cut to a scene inside of his car in some deserted parking lot where Delilah is playing on the radio. And we're sighing into each other's mouths to drown out her voice. Me, a jammed up printer, him, a Dyson vacuum. Our legs wind around each other, our hands are in each other's hair. His a field of wheat, mine a clump of brambles. I glide my lips down his stomach and peer up at him from the fly of his pants, and I know he won't say anything weird about my nose because they're identical, and he says, hey you, and I say, hey Lightning McQueen. I fiddle with the brass knob of his jeans, but then his phone goes off. He lets it vibrate in his pocket against my forearm a few times and then answers and mostly nods a lot and then hangs up. Pixar, I say, knowing somehow. Pixar, he says. They're thinking about Cars 4, he says, and they want to meet with me now. I say I understand and he drives me home, but by then it's too late to call you, so I just sign myself to sleep. The next day I tell you all of this and you understand and everything is forgiven because, I mean, it's Owen Wilson. But the truth is, I was never on my way to you. The truth is, I never even saw Owen Wilson. The truth is, I was too scared to get out of bed. And even if I had, if I had been walking down the road and he'd driven past me, I would have been too busy counting steps in my head to look up. That's all I got. Okay, so first of all, whoever, who, <laughs> whoever told you that using Jaden Smith tweets as a conceit for a poetry collection was a bad idea. You need to be like, fuck you. You're done. I'm never taking advice from you again. I was getting a BFA at the time. That's why that happened. Oh, oh, that's, that's, see, that's the kind of toxic shit that happens in creative writing programs. They kill your dreams. No, Kat, these are fucking phenomenal. I, the first one Ha takes this incredible twist that the and in fact i put it in the chat i always have to go back here the black that comes after i love so and it actually works a little better with the jaden tweet jaden smith tweet opening right you start with like the cartoonish like getting crushed by the anvil and turning into the accordion thing and you think like oh this is going to be a fundamentally comic poem right there's a jaden's the jaden smith tweet Here's like direct comparisons to Tom and Jerry. And, and, and then you get to the, the black that comes after and the entire poem turns to just like existential angst and despair. And it, it is such an unbelievable like, like pivot moment. And, and it's also so perfect because it's like the cartoon is over now, right? Like, I, like this conceptualizing of life is this, is this, manic cartoon that you can engage in when other people are around when you have an audience when the show ends and the credits roll and the black screen comes up and you have to like live with that shit then it becomes this kind of <laughs> like like it like bleak existential drama and the whole thing unfurls like beautifully from there i love the owen wilson one for very similar reasons, except this one like twists three or four times in this beautiful, in this beautiful way. I, and it goes from, <laughs> it, it's, it's, what it, 
it's like a fascinating as a piece of like quasi confessional poetry it's really fascinating in the way that it gradually pulls on the thread of this fantasy right like we know we the reader know that we're reading a fantasy we're reading like uh but like we think that's kind of between us and the author right we think it's going to go unacknowledged that this is a kind of like that at the <laughs> that, that that this is like a kind of comic piece about hooking up with us Owen Wilson, but then those last few lines were like it's revealed like that no like we are just like we've been played to some degree right like the it's a it's it's really effective and the the way just like with the cut to black in in the first piece the way there's this like it's like a chasm opens up that swallows the rest of the poem like really it's as if the floor just falls away and you're like oh i was having fun <laughs> no i'm not anymore now it's real fucking sad and it's it's just really effective pieces cat thank you i just want to point out one thing because i wrote this like a few years ago now more than a few years ago now and when i wrote this cars 4 wasn't a thing that had been announced or come out so <laughs> Technically, I did predict and or like manifest into existence Cars 4. So you're welcome slash sorry I, for that. But thank you. That was really sweet. I, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think you could be held completely responsible for Cars 4, but uh, we will hold you a little bit responsible. All right, Cass. Cars is thank awesome. You. Oh, Rudy. Yeah. I, I was just saying Cars is awesome. Have you and seen Owen Wilson. the Cars movies, Rudy? I have not seen. I've seen like. Just one. I've seen Cars. That's the only. That's pretty old, right? That's like 2000. I don't know, man. We're pretty old. I haven't old, even but... seen any of the other ones. I've just seen the first one. So... Yeah. That's, that's... <laughs> Is it just I, Will I and Rudy who are allowed to comment? I just want no, to say. No, no, you can comment. That no, was a oh, no. born classic, and it's still as classic as the day it was born. I've heard that poem or read it many times. <laughs> Anyway, thank you, oh, Kat. Yeah. Oh, Rudy, sorry, were you? No, I was just saying, um, Paris is awesome, and the uh, the pickup truck thing that's voiced by Larry the Cable Guy is one of the only characters I remember besides the Owen Wilson one. So yeah, I I've only like seen it on in the background at like my grandparents' house, like my little cousin was watching it or whatever. Because yeah, I think Rudy, you and I were. <laughs> Full grown fucking adults when the first we were a little too old to be watching a little, yeah. little too old to admit to be watching <laughs> i miss it i'll admit to it i don't give a fuck oh okay all right thank you cat and rudy you might as well keep your mic unmuted because you are up next all right so um tonight um, i'm actually not gonna read um i have a, um somebody what so i think we all we all know um a famous person uh, named Orenthal James Simpson, better known as O.J. Simpson, better known as the Juice. Um, is actually going to read some poetry. Um, and I was, <laughs> he's going to start out, I guess, by reading a uh, John Berryman poem, actually, Dream Song 29, uh, which he agreed to read um, under the condition that nobody uh, take it um, as some kind of admission of guilt or take it, you know, his reason, nobody questioned his reasons for reading it, basically. That's the whole thing. That's why he's going to read it. So, uh, to do that, uh, is it okay if I share my screen? Definitely, definitely. Do you want me to put the the Google Doc um, you put in the other, in the in the reading document in the chat, or is that just for you? Oh, I I can um I'll drop that after the dream song if that's cool. Yeah. I I got the link so I can I can do that. Alrighty, well let me share my screen. Um, I'm gonna share my Winamp because I still have Winamp uh, because I'm fucking stupid. I don't know. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, O.J. Simpson. There sat down once a thing 
on Henry's heart so heavy if he had a hundred years and more and weeping sleepless in all them time Henry could not make good. Starts again, always in Henry's ears, the little cough somewhere, an odor, a chime, and there is another thing he has in mind, like a grave Sienese face. A thousand years would fail to blur the still profiled reproach of, ghastly with open eyes he attends, blind, all the bells say, too late, this is not for tears, thinking, but never did Henry, as he thought he did, end anyone and hacks her body up and hide the pieces where they may be found. He knows he went over everyone and nobody's missing. Often, he reckons, in the dawn, them up. Nobody is ever missing. I could be a... There's OJ uh, with his rendition of the classic dream song. Um, so I guess, uh, actually, man, can you share that document? Uh, because I'm in, uh, this, I don't want to unshare my screen. I'm really lazy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. Can. There so you these go, are man. two. You're all, you're all thank set. you. Thank you, sir. Um, <laughs> these, these are two poems that, uh, that I wrote that, uh, OJ Simpson agreed to read for me. Um, not because they're similar to anything that, uh, he did or anything or didn't do or whatever. Um, but because he is the poet at heart and he he likes poetry, you know, he's a fan of poetry and a fan of our community, so cool. It's called If I Did It. I could be a real denizen, a real boy with fulfilling joy, enough of the right food, the funnest toys to put me in the mood for love, etc. instead of hate, instead of rolling the dice that degrade me, little erosions of fist. If I did it, I could be relaxing luxuriously on a beach instead of being a beached whale, about 40 that the town has to bury or dynamite, about 40. That's how many chunks of dynamite they'll use to knock me into the sky. Foreman says we're done here in about 40. That's how many minutes of extra studying in math and science I would have needed each night to catch runaway classmates, the contraband of knowledge, college, the slave catcher in the rye, opening its arms wide for me. If I did it, I could leave ruins, small things that would never sit right again, like Roman catamites, hollows in friends, family, sleepy, hollowed creative projects, halting at bridges to somewhere. Certainly, I could leave arguments unfinished, unhad, impending looping constantly in sympathetic minds, playing as ghost data for unsympathetic ones in posts, in texts, in discord. Imagine the chaos. I'd be laughing hard, spookier me, just sitting there at some memorial service or memorial League of Legends game while my dudes go 1984, blowout, while someone on my account says offensive things, offensive player of the year. Imagine the tears. I hope not too many. I was just a faggot anyway. Anyway, things might be better, worse, different without me. After I, Cobain, after I co-author a Bane with RX Lithium or OF Mossberg, if he'll have me, if they'll have me, if hell will have me, if I did it. So that, uh, yeah, this last one here is called The Juice, uh, which uh, was OJ's uh, call sign or um, you know, moniker. Uh, this one is about juice uh, in the gaming sense, uh, as in, you know, that move has a lot of juice or that, you know, it's, it's like they call it game feel uh, in video games where there's like a lot of feeling or a lot of like impact. It feels to a jump or like a movement or something like that. So that's the juice. Anyway, this is the juice read by the juice. A knife sliding into a body, conferring death state, twist, grind, shimmy, melee kill, resting control temporarily, Satan take the wheel, while other devils stand ready, queuing for permission to skull fuck, skull tingling, audible crunch rip, like zipping up paprika chicken in crowded Ziploc, in my skull candy, acid snow, camo crusher, ANC2, sensory bass headphones with active noise canceling, tab switch to 1964, here, kitty. Kitty, I'm a different shade of dark meat thrusting and knife palmed, napalm falling somewhere, and in me as I tear up insides outside and the herring gone. 36 motherfuckers standing by or by standing. Arena of the scramdolus wham bam, you loose. Night pavement of rough showed boots. Feline made web, you lose. Knee locked. A knelt before ashy man's black tower. Another squib squeeze squeak. Her sliding down the generically textured locked door, normal mapped, leaves blood trail while I patrol under moonlight, 
under wide brim, throwing my hat into the ring of this self-made contest, do a fatality, Kung Lao, dynamic audio reeling, as she is, put yourself into my shoes, near literally, soggy, slight toe cramp, and feel all aberration that isn't chromatic, see the chromatic, pavement outright hostile at this point in time, the sounds of this moment in both ears and haptic equivalents as I bolt up an access ramp, some distant developer raves about accessibility, bolt of lightning strikes your stomach as I catch her running in this walking simulator, how dare crawling, limping simulator, you're there vitting through me, vitting simulator, minds are blazing with feels, feeling simulator, she's sobby, wobbly, necklace she has on says rob me, emerald, boxing her in, can't escape, ruby, claustrophobia in your amphitheater game room, 12 to 15 gamepad spasms, reducing magnitude as I finish the job, and yours starts in 15 minutes, so turn the house lights up, amble to your car. It's too bad ambling isn't as satisfying as walking. Have you heard there, OJ got a little bit, uh, a little bit ganja, a little kind of Jamaican flair to it. So I, I didn't, I didn't uh, ask him to do that. He kind of improvised that. So, but yeah, I'm gonna unshare my screen. <laughs> Holy. Fuck! Holy fuck, man! Jesus! So, <laughs> I okay. So, I want to talk about the dream song thing first. I'm going to talk about the dream song thing first, and then I'm going to talk about the original poems. I know you showed this to me last night, and I I said a little bit that, but this <laughs> this is just so fucking appropriate. Like, yeah, like okay. First of all. The basic fucking joke here is funny. Like that having OJ Simpson read that dream song in particular, right? The never did I ends her, like the the body body up, up. <laughs> pack the body up. But, I mean, that's so perfect. That's so perfect. But what I love here is the way that the like that OJ Simpson's voice really brings out something specific about that poem, which is that fundamentally there's this deep ambiguity in that, like in those final couple of lines, like uh, nobody is ever missing, right? About whether, whether what happened earlier in the poem is a kind of like nightmare or a kind of like, you know, like like the fear of committing murder, whether it's about like the anxiety of of believing you did something terrible that you didn't do, mm-hmm. or whether that la- those last couple of lines are a denial of actual guilt, right? Like a claim of innocence when you're actually guilty, a, way, a like defense mechanism, uh, you know, an unwillingness to admit what you really did. And with it, with OJ reading that poem, it really brings out that ambiguity right it really brings out the level to which that poem that, like all these little yeah. inherent nuances to the poem that are just improved by having oj read it now yeah I, yeah sorry oh no go ahead sorry i fucking love the your two oj poems now i would have loved them even if you had just read them you know but having oj read them is so good because they so if you had read if i did it right it would have been like oh this is a poem about suicide right and you rudy is playing with the the oj simpson reference to write this kind of heartbreaking poem about about like you know uh, you you know about the decision to end your own life and but having oj read it in that cadence turns the whole thing into this like um, triumphant poem about suicide, right? Like if, if there yep. was a question about when, how <laughs> how this poem feels about suicide, having OJ read it answers that question. And that that's, oh man, that's so fucking effective. And that the AI did, as you said, the AI got a little, um, a little bit like, <laughs> Jamaican is one way to put it, but it definitely <laughs> it, it, it definitely deviated a little bit from OJ in the second poem. But in that first poem, yeah. 
like oh my god the delivery was next level um but but even setting all that aside i love the flow of this poem and it the poem is written like perfectly to be read by an ai because the flow is so like it's it's yep. it's so direct it's so straightforward it really is like uh, there's such a like direct forward facing intensity to this poem that it really is like oj with the football under his hand under his arm running the touchdown right where except where the yeah, touchdown I mean, is blowing yards. your brains out. <laughs> um yeah so so that that one that one's just wonderful and the juice one is so good for similar reasons which is that it's a very dark poem with very like but with like very manic triumphant energy and i love like the uh the way you handle like the the kitty genevieve stuff and the way it becomes this kind of fantasy that fully becomes a fantasy at the point where the guy is like throwing his hat off and he it's like this like the the way this character you've created like transforms throughout the poem and becomes like more kind of oddly mythic as it goes along and it really is like like achieving a kind of flow state except this is like a um psychopathic flow state <laughs> where and yeah. then the, the ending where like you have to get up and you have to leave the game and you have to like stumble out to your car and like mm -hmm. the flow state leaves you and you have to exist in the real world it's just the perfect ending for this piece anyway you you brought I, you and oj brought the fucking house down tonight oj that's all the juice um for the last one i was kind of thinking of like a uh a walking simulator inspired by the bystander, you know, Kitty Genovese murder and stuff. So you're kind of playing as like, I guess, Mosley or, you know, like Winston Mosley or something. Yeah. Uh, but the player gets still gets still an interactive thing. So the player gets to embellish stuff or whatever. So, yeah. Still gets that good game feel. <laughs> the good game feel. Yep, exactly. Well, anyway, thanks for letting me read. All right. Thank you, man. And give OJ my best. I, I know people I know there's a lot of a lot of haters out there who think he did it, but uh, in my heart he'll always be an innocent man. Uh, if he did it. If he did it. I, I anyway, anyway, thank you, man. Mark is up next. Hey. Enjoyed the poems tonight. Uh how's my microphone? Can everybody hear me all right? Sounds perfect. Good. I'm going to read two poems tonight. Uh, and I'll put a link to the poems in the chat box. Uh, but I wouldn't recommend like reading the poems as you're listening. Uh, I never do that. But if you want to read them later, uh, there they are. The first poem is about the film director Orson Welles. The title is After Orson Welles. Sparkly and spinning and dotted with blue bottle flies, the impaction of fecal pop culture that's ossified excrement, a mirror ball of constipated narcissistic shit revolves high above gliding light leopard print hide, reverse compound bug eye, lenses arrayed on a spherical surface projecting and scattering light from the embers yet glowing inside the attendant below who remain in their seats and then thrall to the pattern and swirl of the dots as the audience tamps their extended capacity magazines shaped like bananas against Kevlar flared helmets, seeding the primers of cartridges flush to the walls of the chambers. A plain weave of thick battens creak under sprung hardwood dance floor as the heavy, like a penguin, waddles out and wheezing 
skirts the crowd, wholly cooperative, parting for this man, stirred to the dais like cream in a coffee, stunned at the gravity of an object much greater than him, stirred through the crowd to the dais, his movement centripetal, stirred through the big crowd, he's used to the cheap seats. This newly centripetal man, dressed like a rich Uncle Pennybags, Mr. Monopoly Man. The crowd parts and makes way for Black Hat, the fat man, bouncing on balls of his feet as he bobs in the spotlight that tracks him while coming to get his award. It's his lifetime attrition award. Doffing his Hamburg, kettle curl brim in white knuckle, damp hand with head bowed, a black satin scarf pussy bow hung around neck and limp under gray beard. Everything's Jake, cause the jailbird's no longer in jail. As he mentions tonight, we're all of us Jews anymore and black, all of us black anymore, still sharing his clemency after a lifetime of shame and professional infamy with those other survivors, then going on to make his pitch, inviting everyone who's anyone to the never ending party, his fantasy inflicted on reality. Is he pathetic, prophetic, ironic? This maverick director so lately led in from the cold of artistic irrelevance, pouring his heart out in front of a sunset as yellow and round as a lemon while indigo slides down the curve of horizon, refracting the bright metal points that are stars on the fabric of twilight. Tan trench coat snug over corpulent shoulders and trunk, wind whistling, foam windscreen tapping the microphone, his eyes wet and heart full, voice trembling. He recites Shylock's speech in the Arizona desert at night. Is he thinking of the future, of whatever career he may have now that the past is atoned for? Slights imagined or real, but inflated. Does it matter? An angry man who has gorged on his feelings of anger and rancor, his whole life been deprived of depriving an audience necessarily mass of his genius, been cheated of cheating the public of work he was never permitted by fate to complete. He watches his lover and muse, former porn actress, now a reality show starlet, walked down a somnolent Mediterranean late summer afternoon sidewalk. Her light tissue thin sundress molded to apex of hips as it traces her abdomen, showing the beak of clitoris, a hard bud that promises pleasure, but whose the taut fabric slit yawns. With each step, the wide A-line hem tugged into the cleft of the gap between thighs as she struts like a model who's walking a catwalk, the old European pedestrian square lined with the faces of men who have faces like battles they lost to the blitzkrieg, their heads turning, necks craning, eyes keen and far-sighted, hands wiping slack open mouths as the woman he needs because she doesn't need him walks away, always walks away, her indifference sublime as gravity. 
his daughter years later asks him, is there like video footage of you two together? The second poem is titled, The Gambler Reasons That There's No Such Thing as a Random Number Generator. Gambling with limitless funds, without limits for eternity, he'll eventually win come out ahead, that is, the scientist wryly observes. Maybe she knows what she's doing, he thought, before everything started to spin. The white blur stretches and lengthens, caresses the visible crescent of vertical frictionless overhang clockwise no fewer than three times and loses momentum. A caterwaul and hiss that breaks up as it laps and then slows. Three quarter inches of ivory finding the grade, the roulette ball descends the defensive perimeter and then slips from the track. The bottom track notched with fate's bias Brass diamond-shaped studs inlaid on polished grain, alternating tangential and radial orientation, eight canoes to deflect the path of the slowing, tumbling, free-falling ball, three of four of the small triangular facets bored with pneumatic jets, under table, air compressor fed, free fall that ends with a click, a record player needles skip aloft the groove of reedy squawk followed by clatter. The spinning perimeter rotating counter to rotating wheel head that's counter to rotating varnished mahogany cone at a pitch angled down from the center and ringed with a series of shallow compartments, submerged profile of contour of frets engineered to exaggerate bounces and broaden the field of the scatter. Every concentric arrangement conceived with the aim of disguising an other than unsystematic result, hiding the truth of statistical memory, trying to surface and break through the membrane these serial randomized boundaries make, because nothing is random but things as they are. Grouped numbers, always a part of the greater conspiracy that will ultimately reveal itself. Finding the parapet empty, he sees her, her shoulders and neck rigid as she rocks on her heels, swaying like something set in a socket. He can tell she's responding to commotion below. Alternate ball in the steeple of capstan, the capstan for appearance's sake only. The turret scratches a code with its metal taproot in the viscous bottom of the bowl. Tripping on acid body hair follicles, carpet a pale bony wrist that emerges from white polyester of sleeve as the dealer reaches to spin the wheel and then fires the ball. Anchors away everything on the lozenge that's red on the red lozenge of throat inflammation, on the red throat lozenge. The gambler diagrams a ghostly algorithm in his dusty classroom mind and waits for the dealer to telegraph routine practice wed to unconscious expression of force variation, coating the snowball of chance with titanium. 
Yes, he's dressed for success and sex too while you're at it. His extract of confidence bottled and sold to emasculate dupes who are desperate for hard-ons in China. The gears crash. The car jumps a few feet. A third-rate hotel. Greasy spoon food. What if she said no? She wonders aloud to herself and considers the rust-colored outcrop of lithified sandstone that shows off a frenzied aeolian crossbed. Wheel without memory, but not the dealer, and with laws to obey, compensating for trends, self-correcting, achieves confirmation. The gambler's faith, so strong it wills. Long did the numbers or color belong to the herd of the past. Probability ahistorical, the experts say. Short-term results mirror long-term results only to men sick with slow death. Every event's independent not enslaved to denote expectations and yet conformation ongoing but causeless, illusion of memory, numbers that match probabilities, sidetracked by trends, start to feel pressured. Chance matures. As the future dwindles, the past comes due. In the throes of winning, the gambler tips the casino staff, and the dealer shows the surveillance cameras his open palms to end his shift, making way for the next in line. So I, I just want to make sure that you're done and you didn't have another one before I before I before I go on. I'm done. Okay, good. Mark, Mark, I fucking love both of these poems. I so I want to I want to talk about the second one first because I feel like this is a poem after my own heart, right? <laughs> because I love probability, I love chance. I have like the the like gambler's brain sickness deep right, in me right and i love what you've done here because i love the way that this like poem <laughs> both like confirms and satirizes its title right like all right so the premise is that there's there's no such thing as randomness in the universe which the, po the poem doesn't necessarily answer that question, but which is fundamentally true on a certain level, right? If you can understand the inner working of this incredibly complex and sophisticated and multifaceted universe, then yeah, right. there is no chance. But the way you lay this out, the way you go so deep into like the intricacy of how all these different pieces fit together. The, and, the, and the more that overwhelms us, the more that overwhelms the reader, the more the reader gets lost in all the nitty gritty nuance of all these different details that go into this game, you know, that go into right. determining the result, the more the reader becomes totally fucking lost. And the more the reader <laughs> becomes willing to concede to the randomness of the universe. Like, it's like, yeah, okay, the, the universe may be patterned and structured, but the pattern is so fucking complicated and dependent on so many minute variables. And the way that you present that in the poem, the way that it's not like you just fucking tell the reader, now it's complicated. The way that the reader <laughs> gets sucked in through the sheer like, like immensity and frequency of these details and gets lost in that system is fucking beautiful, man. And I, I legitimately, honestly love it. Um, and and the way it ends, <laughs> the way it ends is so brutal and heartbreaking because this is this is one deal, right? This is one movement. This is one, and like this is, and then that cycle is going to repeat, 
like that's the right. whole that's poem right. is, is 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 a excuse me tiny tiny sliver of time and that infinitely complex cycle is going to repeat an infinite number of times and the way you present that with like the dealer say so it, it's so like gentle and subtle and not like there are ways a different poet could have made that point at the end that would have been like whacking you with a fry pan right but instead mm. like it's so gentle the way you do it it's so like simple and straightforward and concise it's just like it's you know the next dealer is up a anyway man that that's phenomenal i i want to talk about the arson wells poem because i i really dig the way that this poem is like one long tracking shot you can feel the camera like panning across the life of this man slowly and i love that because and i, I i'm guessing like you're probably aware of this but arson wells like infinite infamously directed what at the time was the longest tracking shot in film history in touch of evil and right and this is so like that this is like except like instead of panning across that street and that like cityscape and watching the characters interact you're like panning across the scope of this man's like increasingly desperate and pathetic life in in this, this wonderful way where like the shot never breaks right like the way it's presented even though you're you're there's a lot in this poem there are no like clean even breaks instead it's this kind of slow pan except except at the very end right and i love the way that that final line the, is there a video footage of you two <laughs> you to, you two together totally under it's like it's like a punch in the face it like undermines like it breaks up everything and subverts everything that came before and oh man it's it's man mark these these two poems are fucking phenomenal and i really appreciate you reading them well i'm i'm glad you i'm really glad you like them uh i'm i'm really glad that you were able to relate to the gambler uh poem you know, that that whole thing, the gambler's fallacy, the way our minds, you know, we look for like some kind of pattern and we believe, you know, because the prior numbers have been something that the future means something. And, you know, the depth of our attempts to rationalize it is is really, um, you know, it, it's a fascinating thing. But thank you. Thank you. I'm really glad you liked them. Yeah, they're great, Mark, and glad to see you back again, man. Hey, it's great, great to be back. All right. So um, Colton's up next, and Jan has been added to the night. So Hello. Jan, probably close. Well, you hear me? Maybe we'll be closing us out. Hey, it's Meta. Hey, Colton. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, good. Uh, I'm going to send the link now. Um this has been a piece that I've been working on with Keith for the last few days. I started starting this piece took writing two other pieces to get here, but I don't know. It's been a really nice journey and adventure. Uh, yeah, it is a set collab. Um, yeah, I thank Keith for helping me with editing this. I've been writing. I've been like, I'm literally like in my backyard staring at the Scottsdale like Valley right now. So writing about the West has been really fun. <clears throat> But this piece is for a contest that I'm gonna submit to, so I'm really like paranoid. So if anyone if anyone takes this, I know where I know you are. I know who you are. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna. My parents are kind of waiting on me, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. This piece is called. Uh, it was it was inspired um, by Adam Johnson's character Larson, but the person in the story, Ole Larson or Ole Larson, whatever, however you uh, say his name is a real person that died and uh, is buried in Memphis. <clears throat> All right, so this piece is called Larson Lends a Helping Hand. Sunday, January 29th, 1865. I think it's Rizor, right? I'm just going to say Rizor. Rizor, Norway. Notes from Worship. In 1844, the American prophet Joseph Smith, first president of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, left Nauvoo, Illinois, with his brother Hiram Smith, both fearing for their lives. After both men were imprisoned in Carthage, Illinois, for treason, Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram were gunned down in the Carthage jail. 
after Joseph Smith's assassination, the second president of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, Brigham Young, accompanied Mormon pioneers from Nauvoo and successfully relocated to a new, a new settlement in Great Salt Lake Valley. After sending missionaries to Europe and Scandinavia to recruit members to the church, Brigham Young was, select, was elected the first governor of the Utah Territory. Despite abandoning settlements in New York, Missouri, and Illinois, the Latter-day Saints secured a new refuge for all Mormon pioneers in America and overseas, Old Larson. Sunday, March 19, 1865, Riser, Norway. In 1861, my hometown of Riser was set ablaze. Hundreds of wooden houses and buildings were burned down. Experienced carpenters like myself were called to rebuild Riser when the smoke cleared. As I rebuilt Riser, I realized I could fix disaster. I rediscovered my purpose. I remember when my wife Ingborg and I watched our firstborn son, Andrew, sail off on his own to Utah in April of 1863. He was only 19 years old. This decision shocked us. Uh, for many, the Civil War in America was too dangerous, but for Andrew, it was a calling sign for justice. Months later, Ingborg and I were baptized into the Church of Latter-day Saints, Old Larson. Good Friday, April 14, 1865, Riser, Norway. Took a walk down by the shipping docks this morning. I spoke with a Scottish fireman named Adam. I told him that I was to leave Norway and journey to Utah in America. Adam recalled that he overheard British Navy officers conversing about the Civil War in America. It seems formal warfare will end soon. I shared this new information with Ingborg. After much prayer and consideration, Ingborg and I decided to sail to America. Our ship leaves April 21st. The children are most excited for our new life. They ask questions about American cowboys and sea monsters in the Atlantic. I assure them that the Heavenly Father will grant us safe travels. I am aboard the Tenaro ship with my family and other Norwegians from Rizor and Kragero. Rain has put us all under the deck. Our priorities on board include staying warm, washing often to avoid illness, and meeting for worship. Captain Thord Vil Thordvildsen enjoys our children and their curiosity. Ellen and Georgine were allowed to steer the ship while in calm waters upon departure. Vanka, Tomina, and Martha all take turns using a spyglass to locate constellations at night. Martin and John play catch with the sailors and farmers on board. Ole and Bent spend their afternoons looking for pirate ships. The crew enjoys our company. We should arrive at the port of Quebec by June 2nd. From Quebec, we will sail again to New York and then ride by railway to meet with Brother Johnson in Chicago, Illinois. Brother Johnson is another Latter-day Saint from Riser. He has secured lodging and resources for my family. Old Larson. Saturday, June 3rd, 1865, on the St. Lawrence River. My family and I arrived in Quebec safely and in good spirits. The Civil War is over. We are on a steamboat approaching Buffalo, New York. I can finally see America. She is beautiful. The sunset over the St. Lawrence River invites serenity, hope, but the assassination of former President Abraham Lincoln causes unease. Vice President Andrew Johnson will be the new president for the United States. What this means for the future of the Church of the Latter-day Saints will only be known as we travel further into America. Old Larson. Tuesday, Independence Day, July 4th, 1865, Chicago, Illinois. Today is the first Independence Day since the Confederate surrender. Brother Johnson tells us that we will see a great show of gunpowder lights and bursting cannons to celebrate unity and liberty. Ole and Bent are outside playing baseball. They dream of starting a league in Utah. I hope to make their dreams come true. Old Larson. Friday, November 10th, 1865, Chicago, Illinois. News tells us of skirmishes between Indian tribes native to the Great Basin and westbound Latter-day Saints settling into the Great Salt Lake Valley. I do not wish to pick up a rifle, but I will do what I must to protect my fellow brothers and sisters. Old Larson. Tuesday, January 9th, 1866, Chicago, Illinois. The rapid rate of industrialization has been incredibly terrifying to witness. One only needs to see the unparalleled power and speed of the organized slaughter and transportation of cattle brought on by the Union Stockyard and Transit Company, Old Larson. 
May 11th, 1866, Chicago, Illinois. Cholera and yellow fever cases continue to multiply in New Orleans and other Mississippi Delta towns. City officials in Mississippi or in Memphis, Tennessee, are calling for carpenters in the area to help build coffins for their dead. Without thinking, I accepted the call to help. Accommodations have been made for us to travel by steamboat to Memphis as soon as possible. Days ago, white Southerners waged violence against freed Negroes in Memphis. People are calling it a massacre. Ingborg worries for our health and safety. Old Larson. Thursday, August 2nd, 1866, Memphis, Tennessee. Coffin manufacturing is a booming industry here in America. Some undertakers are building coffins using metal. Before working in this factory, my last experience building a coffin was in September of 1849. I built the casket for my infant son, George, when he passed. He is buried back home in Norway. Old Larson. Tuesday, September 25th, 1866, Memphis, Tennessee. Tragedy. Ellen and Georgine have passed on to be in the spirit world. They were such amazing girls. Ellen was eight years old. Georgine only 15. Ingborg is locked in the bedroom. Inconsolable. We are unsure as to the cause of death. Doctors say it could either be the dreaded yellow fever or cholera. Autumn season is here, though all I see are rain clouds. The weather in Memphis is as unpredictable as fate itself. Old Larson. Monday, Jew Lofton, Christmas Eve, December 24th, 1866, Memphis, Tennessee. Yellow fever cases are stabilizing. Workers have been sent home from the factory to spend time with loved ones. This is my first Christmas Eve in America. Ole and Martin are outside playing with their new hickory bats and leather baseballs. Ingborg is in the kitchen with the other children making cheese-covered wrist grot, funeral potatoes, lepsa, and hasty pudding. After our meal, we will sing carols and open more presents until bedtime. Old Larson. Saturday, February 2nd, 1867, Memphis, Tennessee. Ingborg and I are celebrating 24 years of marriage today. Blistering winds have chilled our plans. Everything is covered in ice. The entire household is huddled around the fireplace. Ingborg reminisces about the early days of our relationship frolicking in Norwegian snow. Time moves quickly, but our love is strong. Without it, I could not have sailed to America. Old Larson. Wednesday, May 15th, 1867, Memphis, Tennessee. I wonder what bodies will be put into the caskets that I make here. How long will I have to make these caskets here in Memphis? Will my pine coffins be <laughs> will my pine coffins be strong enough to last forever? Who will build my coffin? Sunday, September 29th, 1867, Memphis, Tennessee. Today is my 59th birthday, one year without Aline and Georgine. Ingborg baked a traditional blot cake. The children left this morning by wagon to purchase eggs, flour, milk, and sugar from the store. Ingborg likes to use milk to keep the baked sponge cake wet while also encoding layers of the cake with a sweetened whipped cream. I am thankful for God's tender mercies. Ole Larson. Wednesday, October 9, 1867, Memphis, Tennessee. I pray that my time in Memphis will come to an end soon. Ingborg and I both agree we must reunite with my son Andrew in Fountain Green, Utah. There, I can build a new community for future Larsons and live until the end of my days. Old Larson. Mormon pioneer Old Andreas Larson died in Memphis on Tuesday, October 22, 1867. However, the Larson family did eventually make it to Fountain Green, Utah, with help from the Johnson family. And then that's a bunch of citations and stuff from the cemetery where I got info about Old Larson and uh, where his headstone's at. And then this passenger log where it shows him and his family uh, on the sh on the Tenero ship with that captain and the date it left and the date it got to America. So that's it. Colton, this piece is fascinating to me because you it's showing me an entirely new side of you as a writer because this is so, on every conceivable level, 
unlike anything you've read here before. Like stylistically, it's like the polar opposite because you it's it's so tightly controlled, right? It's so concise, it's so focused. As I said, it's just like so tightly controlled. Whereas you are usually like, and I and I mean this in like the most flattering way possible, a writer of excess, right? Like you are usually somebody <laughs> with out there in terms of your prose, in terms of your subject matter, in terms of everything, right? And to see something so tightly and meticulously restrained from you is is really fucking interesting. And even so, you managed to wring so much emotion out of this carefully controlled piece. Like, and, and knowing, like, and carefully constrained too, right? Because you were working with just what you know about a real human life here. You have like, you are in your own kind of like precisely built coffin here that you can't work outside. And yet you manage just through the details you choose and just in part by keeping your tone so straight and so measured and so deadpan, you manage to get at the like, just fundamental tragedy of this guy's life. Like, the, the like constant like unrealized sort of yearning here like it it's it just like having a plan like it, it's like the perfect immigrant narrative where they go to america with a very clear idea of what they want to do and in his lifetime anyway he doesn't get there he never like, and it's it seems on the surface like such a simple plan you're going to go sail to you're going to sail to the US and then you're going to travel to Utah and you're going to live in Utah with your son like what could be simpler than that and the way that all these little things intervene to make it impossible and all the tragedy along the way it's 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 heart wrenching it's heart wrenching without you ever being like hey this is a sad moment you know and like yeah. When I was writing this story, I was like, okay, this is not going to be this like de like the de depressing pro shit that I write. But as I'm writing, I'm like, oh my god, this guy went through hell. Yeah. Like, like, I mean, to losing his son. But I will say, it is fascinating that when the Mormons came, especially from like Europe and Scandinavia to America, there were like over like dozens of ships that sailed and like like all of them except for one made it which is insane and that helped like the followers be like hey we all made it for a reason and so just like every step of the way he gets more hope and like i wanted the reader to be like oh my god like he's gonna do it he's gonna make it and then it's just like fucking boom he's dead like yeah because he wanted the help that is like like the whole mormon thing is like do good if you keep doing good you're doing good like and you know, he just decides like, OK, instead of going here to Utah, I'm going to go here to Memphis and like puts himself into the fucking heart of darkness, you know? Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I it's just, just this person who incidentally was traveling across the world while one of the most important events in world history, the Civil War, went, was going on and, you know, quote unquote, finishing up. And I mean, he is seeing the stage set for what America will be, you know, like the, the rapid industrialization, the social tensions in the South, like everything. And he's just like, I'm just trying to go to Utah, man. Like, it's like, in a way, this is like the, oh gosh, the Forrest Gump, but like, it's just yeah, like, right. like the, the whole time, the whole time I was like, oh my God, like when is he going to meet the fucking black power movement? Like, <laughs> right, right. No, it, it, it's, it's fascinating because it's, it's very much that. And yet, you wisely don't draw an excessive amount of attention to that, right? You have the sense that he right. keep the sense that he's focused on his family and his goal and his reason for being here and his faith. And yet he's not oblivious either. He sees the civil war winding down around him. Excuse me. He see, he's personally impacted by the yellow fever outbreak. And, and it's, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a great piece. It's a great piece. And like I said, really fascinating to me, as like a piece of your writing too. I always like it when an author comes in and they share something and I'm like, I didn't know that person could write that, <laughs> you know? Um, Dude, it was shocking to me. I mean, again, it took me straining my writing two times. This is like a double titrated piece of just me saying like, okay, this is not historical fiction. This is not historical fiction. Okay, this is historical fiction. Now make it better. Get Keith and fucking 
I still have to show Adam this piece because, like, uh, to me, this is like my Christmas present to him almost. You know, it's like <laughs> I made him a little, made him a character. You know, some yeah. like Scottish fisherman, but like maybe this is I mean, Larson's think, ancestor. Who knows? I saw, I, dude. Like, I was waiting to read something about where he like had a dog and it like mysteriously went away. I'm like, <laughs> ah, I know what he did with that dog. I know exactly what he did with that dog. Oh my god! I hope to. I don't know this. If I if this piece does well when I submit it, it'll give me a thousand dollars. So hey. I am like. Man, yeah, man, I'll fucking pray to whatever Mormon God is fucking out there. I'll pray to Joseph Smith. Yeah, collect that bag, man. <laughs> Bro, anyway, that's what I'm trying to do. I appreciate thanks. you and Rudy and everybody who read before me. This has been a really good uh, free Xmas MLC. But thank y'all. Thank y'all for it the has been. All right, thank you, Colton. And uh, winding down tonight, closing up the night. Is Jan? Except as usual, I don't think Jan is reading his own piece. I think. Rudy, are you reading Jan's piece? Jan says hi in the chat. Night, Colton. Oh, oh night, night, man. That was a good piece, dude. Fucking Oregon Trail vibes. <laughs> <laughs> dude, oh my god, fucking Oregon Trail. I no. <laughs> what's crazy? Uh, before I go, one more thing. I did research on this guy, and everyone's saying he died of yellow fever, but his mm. death registry was written in one they misspelled his name and they wrote down instead of writing down yellow fever for when he died they wrote down diarrhea so diarrhea. oh no <laughs> I know. And, and to be a mormon too and to have that on your dirt person right. dude because yes, uh, like, like i know what a, they want to like it's a symptom of yellow fever sure. and or cholera yeah. so like either one but like just imagine if I come in and I'm like he didn't actually die of yellow fever he just shit himself to <laughs> he shit right. himself to right. <laughs> That'll, I don't I I really have to think about like what like how do I end the piece like do I end it with this like Hollywood like oh he died of yellow fever he's a hero or yeah he kind of made the bad wrong decision and kind of shit himself to death I don't know yeah. I don't know <laughs> well it's, it's awesome. in that ambiguity that we all have to live <laughs> yep it's the ambiguity all right thanks Colton Rudy Jan what do you got for us uh so uh Jan has. Uh, taking over my body again, um, like that Death Cab for Cutie song, I Will Possess Your Heart. Um, and so I'm going to read this fucking poem he's commanding me to read. But first, this is a disclaimer uh, to read before the poem. Uh, presumably written by Jan. Uh, I don't like poetry about the moon, but I do like the moon landing. Whatever. A parent yelled at me after school today, so I'm in one heck of a mood tonight. Uh, this poem is called Ed Gein Witnesses the Moon Landing. Ooh. Found not guilty by the state of Wisconsin, reason being insanity, which no one doubts. Contemporary white picket fences and American apartheid, hands getting older and face uglier. Heartbroken by Puritanism, by mother, like a bear now, at a roadside zoo, trapped in a pit, where he a coyote, he could gnaw his leg off, and escape, and dig up corpses again, but the floors are linoleum, he isn't a coyote, he's getting old, in the common room, men are on the moon, no one cares, they will go back six times and no more. In three years is 1,095 days. In that time, he will have shit a lot, eaten a lot of food, slept through half of that time, and nothing else. Fuck, man. The, I, I... <laughs> First of all, this is a this is a poem that only Jan could have written. So Jan, if you're still warmed into Rudy's body, I want to give you props for that. But I first of all, just this poem had me at its premise, right? Because this is the exactly the kind of like stark juxtaposition that immediately grabs you because you don't you don't think of Ed Gein and the moon landing as having existed in the same period, right? Even though, even though they did, I just looked up on Wikipedia and he died in 1984, but 
like because there's something so primitive about his crimes right like there's something so deeply like primordial about it to have that contrasted with like the pinnacle of human technological achievement is is just it's just a fascinating like it's just a fascinating exploration of like the two extremes that we're capable of as a species and the way it's executed here that kind of like like restless restless animalistic despair that he's experienced experiencing while being institutionalized it, it's so oh man i love the fucking in the common room men are on the moon and nobody cares that is man i would i am so envious of that set of lines i am every once in a while something will be read here and i'm like fuck i wish i had written that and that that got that response for me and the whole thing is so effective it's so effective as i said um the juxtaposition alone is genius and the execution is perfect so and you, you what a what a perfect poem to end our last misery loves company before christmas on right <laughs> i couldn't think of anything better than a poem about a cannibalistic serial killer being very christmas said gain <laughs> Are we gonna sing the peanuts song now? <laughs> oh Jen, that was good. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Gein. Sorry, I did it. Did I pronounce the last name wrong? Did I say Gein? <laughs> anyway, um. All right. Okay. All right. That's that's it, guys. That's it. I think. <laughs> I don't think we're going to top that tonight. Um, so anyway, I and also I secretly really have to go to the bathroom. So I'm not going to I'm not going to ask if anyone has anything to read. You had your chance to sign up earlier tonight. Uh, we're going to end it there. This has been Misery Loves Company. Thank you to everyone who read tonight. Thank you, James. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Rudy and OJ Simpson. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Colton. And thank you, Jan. And uh, yeah, so we do this every Friday night, um, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific. We tweet out the link before we get started for our Twitter account, at Misery Tourism, all one fucking word. Anyone is welcome to come and join us. Anyone is welcome to come and share their own work. And yeah, that's it. Fucking Merry Christmas, guys, and Happy New Year, because we are fucking out. We're done. We're done for the year. All right. Thanks, guys.